Here's the map. Oh, wait. Probably actually say what the map is on here. But yeah, this is downpour. Oh, wait a sec. Oh, this map. Oh, I can't remember what it was called originally. Trinian. Trinian. Trinian? Something like that. Yeah, this is... This is actually a remake of an older map. I don't know why I didn't notice what it was before. I think it's Trinian. I... I don't know. I mean, it's a... Downpour is a better name, for sure. But, yeah, this map is not going to be long. So... Yeah, don't... What the... Trin Trinian? I thought it was... Oh, Tref... Trefoil. Right, okay, that's what it is. It's, just, it's a variation on the same theme, but it's not actually, it's not actually Trefoil. Trefoil is much more water-based. This is almost the inverse of Trefoil in a way. But at any rate, it is still a small 3v3, or 1v1 map, not 3v3 map. Small 1v1v1 map, used for 1v1. It's still gonna be a bit of a quick match. Guy going immediately for the Shieldbot Factory, while... On the other hand, Anir going for Amphlot Factory. Hey, Amphlot on a water map. That's the second time we've seen that thus far. Not super common, surprisingly enough. Also, clouds. Dynamic clouds. Really dark dynamic clouds. I feel like the dynamic cloud system could use some work. Anyway, that actually has never... I've never seen the dynamic cloud system be that discreet about clouds. So at this point, it's subscribe subscription is like five bucks. I'll, I'll think about what to do with the emote because I would actually like to have the emote a bit more open. I was a bit disappointed if no one was using it. Now I know why. Anyway, the point is, and here, coming in with this this duck right off the bat, which as I mentioned before, ducks not in this tournament, mind you, but ducks don't beat bandits one shot. In fact, the bandit I think will win this engagement or very barely lose because ducks do not one shot bandits. They one shot glaives. Not bandits, and I'm pretty sure that's why Gaia went for the Shieldbot Factory in the first place, because that will be a very strong option for dealing with the ducks. Get a bunch of bandits, don't get one shot, don't get splashed either, because you might get an entire group killed by a double volley, and then you'll be fine. Although we are seeing outlaws coming in right off the bat, which I totally agree with, because the outlaw is going to be necessary to keep this thing alive. I mean, yeah, it's nice to have the band. It's nice that the bandits don't get killed immediately, but there's only so much they can do. Although, you know what? Never mind. Never mind. Water is cover. How does that work? The ducks aren't quite in deep enough water to go for torpedoes. They're in shallow enough water to go for the rockets, but the rockets hit the water and explode, so they can't hit the bandits unless the bandits are close enough. That is a surprising disadvantage. Turnian. Thank you. It's called Turnian. That's what I was thinking of. Not, not Trefoil. But anyway, the the point is, I'm kind of surprised the water is doing the job. Because, what? Why would water do that job? Actually, no, I was thinking of Trefoil. Thanks for the suggestion, Orphelius, but Trefoil was the one I was thinking of in terms of the actual shape. Regardless, both of them are kind of small 1v1v1 maps that have been used for 1v1. And then those cases favorite hover. In this case... You would think favor amp, but missiles don't go through water, and the water's shallow enough that you don't see the ducks firing torpedoes. So the bandits have a massive advantage in the rivers of all places. That is strange. Actually, not even so much bandits. If you saw rogues, rogues have a massive advantage, or thugs maybe as well, would have a massive advantage in the rivers against amphibious bots. I can't say I understand why. I can sort of understand why. I mean, physically, it makes some sense. It's just kind of funny. Not what you'd expect going in. At any rate, Anir will be losing these ducks to apparently carelessness? Shields? Mostly shields. Convict able to handle that no problem. I mean, really, shields against missiles. Kind of a mixed bag. On the one hand, they're very large targets. On the other hand, they're very... They are shields. They block things. They make sure that someone behind them does not get hit. So, I kind of agree with the shields being shields. As you can see, this thug coming in here, shielding off the commander. Make sure the commander doesn't die to the scallops. Doing a good job. Uh, was doing a good job. In fact, it's getting a little bit out of 
out of position. Very much out of position. But hey, that's what shields are for. Hold that defensive line. Why is that... Okay, that thug's being really weird in terms of, posi of its positioning. But regardless, that's giving Guy up the opening they need to take the center. And with that center taken, they do have the economic advantage slightly. At least in terms of metal. Not so much in terms of energy. And Anir... Anir has a lot of energy. All solar plants. Wait, seriously? All solar plants? They have 20 energy up just solar plants? Apparently so. I don't understand quite how, but okay. 16 from the solar plants and another 6 from the commander and... That's some reclaim. Oh, they're reclaiming the weeds. Or the ferns, rather. That would explain it. So yeah, guy up a little weak in the energy right now. Could use some reclaim. Like, really could use some reclaim. Like, they are actually... They are accessing metal hard. And at least they do have some solar plants coming up here. I'm a bit surprised that they aren't going for tidal. There's a lot of open water. Granted, there's also an amphibious bot opponent, so I guess that makes sense. But then it makes me wonder, why is Anir not going for tidal? Because I got this here, and, like, the water's edge is way out in the distance. Like, it, this is... This is open. There's a lot of room to build up here. And that is... That is a thing. I mean... Anir could do that without too much concern of retaliation. I can see why Orphelius... Oh, sorry. Gaia, Orphelius is in chat talking to me. Gaia, I can see why Gaia wouldn't want to do that. But at the same time, Gaia is kind of in a tricky position right now. On the one hand, they have a pretty strong army. They have a massive advantage in terms of attrition. But at the same time, they're kind of in a bit of a tough spot in terms of where to fight. What to fight with. Using a lot of slow units. Still, though, managing to turn that slow unit push into a very strong slow unit push. Getting rid of the entire western expansion from Anir. Breaking up their main expansion, their main base from another one of the expansions over to the south, which is also being attacked by some bandits. Which won't be destroyed by the bandits, as much as the one over to the north will be destroyed by the Thug Law Bull. But it is still going to be damage dealt. Like, the fact that the Thug Law Bull is doing what it is, is still doing a lot to make sure that Gaia is ahead. And that's the key thing, especially as the center is being contested, and honestly, a little bit... It's kind of hard to maintain from the looks of it. Like, Pickett's going down, not, really, not able to really get up any static defenses against the boys in time. And Anir pushing in with static defenses. So, the Thug Law Ball could do some work coming back here. Although, again, it's kind of tricky. The one thing about Amphibs, or particularly the one thing about boys, is that because they're using a status effect attack, slow or paralysis, or like slow EMP, disarm, those deal additional damage to shields. Like, whatever the damage that's listed on here at, like, say, 250, a third of that is directly dealt to shields. So, or is it third or three times? Anyway, that's direct damage to shields. That becomes damage that's not just status effects. And, yeah, it's a third. A third is delta shields. Or actually, wait, no, those are linked shields. No, three times! I was right, I was right the second time. Three times the damage. I don't know why I forgot that. But yeah, so it's slow against things that are hit directly. It's three times the damage, so 750 damage, two shields. So, that is absolutely terrifying. But at the same, but what's also terrifying is the way that Gaia is coming in here over to the southwest and sweeping away everything with really not a whole lot of reinforcements in there. While Anir does block off the center, which does make it a bit trickier for Gaia to push any further. I mean, Anir, with his blockade in the center, can rebuild the northern expansions without too much contest. I mean, yeah, the Thug Law Ball here is doing some damage and it would be able to go back up north. But if it dies, reinforcing that is going to be almost impossible. So Anir's still making the right play in terms of position. It's just that right now their economy is quite weak and Gaia does have an opening from that. They could theoretically use that timing to just push in, break the center opening, make sure that there is room for reinforcements, and then wreck everything. At this point though, clearly they just want to get rid of the boys. Yeah, the, field, the shields are going down quick, but if the boys go down, then at least there's less of a concern and that's not happening. I mean, it's just, it's tough to deal with all those, all that damage coming in. Like I said, the shield damage coming in is a lot of shield damage. Thug Law Ball is not appropriate for that. Rogues would be. Rogues would be the option I would think to go for. Bandits are another option that's reasonable, but a little tricky. You need a lot of bandits just because the, the boys will deal with them. 
boys deal 150 damage and they slow down the bandits. So two shots, get rid of a bandit, and the bandit can hardly do any damage in the meantime. Still to the bandit of the north, however, that bandit is MVP. Getting rid of the conch, completely stopping the northern expansion, making sure that this blockade here does not manage to get value. Even though a near getting the center is still a lot of value to work with, it's just... That's still not enough. The fact that the northern side has been taken, and the fact that Guy was able to turn their economy into enough of a production advantage to make a dozen bandits inside of 30 seconds means that it's going to be very difficult for Anir to contest this. Like, yeah, okay, the Felon might have been a bit of a mistake. It's not able to do much. But the bandits, they can swoop in. They can deal the damage. They can get rid of these boys. There's more than enough. The exact situation I was talking about, you need a lot of bandits to deal with these boys, that's the situation we have. Of course, the problem is that the bandits are still having a problem getting in. There's no real flank coming in. But still, even then, there's enough bandits. There are still enough bandits, and there's still a bit of a flank, and there's still a lot of damage dealt, and... More importantly, the Thuglaw Ball is able to bring up the rear and deal extra damage. If it can get in range, it's the one thing the boys are able to outrange that just slightly. But at this point, the bandits are still able to get a lot of value. Regardless, though, Anir has gotten more value. Thanks to that strong defensive setup in the center of the map, they have turned this around. I talked about defense def before and how you got to be careful about when to use it, and it's not always the best idea, but that's in your main base. What Anir is doing is ideal. They have 2,500 metal reclaim, pretty much right next to their commander, or very nearly next to their commander, they have, on top of that, a, a strong center position they can use as a firebase, as well as a defensive line that leads their units into that center position. So they've got a strong staging area, they have a, a strong retreat point, I guess a strong firebase in general, they've essentially made a fortress in the middle of the map, and that is putting Guy up on a massive back foot. The Racketeer is a good choice to deal with this stuff, but even then, I am so surprised we aren't seeing Guy go for rogues. I'm honestly kind of shocked we are not seeing Guy go for rogues, or for that matter, go for anything. What is Guy up doing? No, seriously, what is Guy up to? I mean, okay, they're focusing on their commander for sure, but, like, they're nearly accessing. At very least, now they've got some locusts being built up. That for sure is a thing. And a nearest commander, unable to do much thanks to the. Thanks to the Racketeers, but really that doesn't matter. Flanking Duck Force is the major problem here. That's the main story, and with that, that is going to get rid of the Racketeers, opening up the commander to do whatever they'd like. Or even if it doesn't get rid of the Racketeers, that at least distracts them enough that the commander can continue to building up and continue to reinforce that center firebase. And that is the thing. If they can manage to pull that off and maintain that firebase, Anir has this. Gaia has lost their economic advantage. They're going for a desperation play off of these Locusts, which isn't able to do much thanks to the fact that the Locusts can't hit underwater. The boys have plenty of room to maneuver. And the Locusts, while they are able to get some damage and possibly pull the boys back above ground, or above the water, it's not enough. And Gaia throws in the towel. That is it. Anir takes it. Anir is moving on to the bracket elimination stage of the tournament. And Gaia, not so much. And also, Hokomoko won theirs, so they are also going to be moving on. And... While Dying Friend is pretty much guaranteed to win theirs, and probably wouldn't have a problem if they didn't. Google Frog, hard to say. And if Kingstead wins it, if Kingstead wins this, they actually do move on with Google Frog. So, Anir's chance to move on is dependent on Kingstead losing. Rather than on Google Frog, or on their own, their own win. Which is a bit of an odd situation to be in, to be sure. But yeah, so Google Frog and Kingstead is there. Okay, well, at any rate, we are going to be moving uh, possibly on to that, if we can. I'd love to see that, because that is the that is the Kingmaker match. That is the match that's going to, well, it's going to decide who is in and who is out. Where is it? Google Frog versus Kingstad is still going on. Yes. Let us rejoin. That is the most important match right now. By far, the match that matters is this one. Let's get to that, because we have a match. Kingstad is going to be... Oh, we're on the left side of the map now. Shieldbot versus Amphib again. Probably the same justification as well, although, admittedly, that is all in my head. But, Kingstad actually managing to maintain a slightly better defense position. Google Frog did expand over to the same expansion as we saw before, but not getting to the center. No one's really taking the center now that Kingstad has managed to take the center a little bit, but even then, it's contested. Google Frog should be able to maintain control over it and possibly even get rid of Kingstad's commander. Kingstad's commander under a decent amount of fire. Going for 
going for heavy upgrade commander on top of that, which is doing a fine job against the boys, but ultimately is still running into some problems. The Gauss Cannon could cause problems on top of that fact that slow is slow. Slow makes units less effective. But even then, King's Dead is still managed to reclaim quite a bit of the center. A lot of the center. Really taking advantage of the reclaim element of the map. Well, Google Frog, with that forward fire base on the air base, that's more than enough. And I think Google Frog very easily has this match. King's Dad has not a whole lot of backup economy. Most of their force went into the commander. And it looks like Google Frog will be able to just clean up from here. And indeed they are. King's Dad throws in the towel. Anir does move on to the next stage of the tournament. As does Google Frog, Dying Friend, and Hokomoko. Well done to all of you. And we will see that when the next stage of the tournament starts. Although I'm actually kind of surprised, uh, think about it, that we are not seeing Dying Friend's results. Because... Unless Pokedraw was just not on. I think Pokedraw didn't connect, so I don't know what's happening. Still, though, that is... It's going to be interesting. So we're moving on to the bracket elimination in a sec. It's There's going to be a short break between the two, because obviously there, there kind of has to be. And Pokedraw still hasn't shown up either, so I... Oh, there they are. There they are. Never mind. No, no Pokedrill. Pokedrill lost, so Dimefriend moving on. Like I said, Dimefriend, Google Frog, Hokomoko, and Anir are going on to the bracket elimination stage. Very cleanly, too. This is not guaranteed, by the way. It doesn't matter how many rounds of Swiss you do. It's not guaranteed it's going to be this clean, but thankfully it is, so no need for any kind of tiebreakers. So, well done to you four. We're moving on to the single elimination bracket. And until then, we're going to have a short break as we set that up. So stay tuned. We will have the single elimination set up in a few minutes.